<laughs> Welcome everyone. All right, we're going to get going. We'd like to welcome everyone. Can I just ask everyone to mute themselves, please? Um, and if you don't know how to mute, there's a band, there's a sort of a bar, sort of two thirds of the way down your screen, and it's got a little microphone. Uh, if you could just press that. Now, for some people, bandwidth is a problem. So if you can, just turn off your video while you're listening. That would be great. Um, we are recording today, so I need to make sure that you're aware that whatever you say or write will be recorded. For the benefit of all of us joining today and knowing that we all um, come from different places, uh, if you haven't used the, this Teams platform before, um, you'll go to the, the mouse bar at the bottom and there'll be a little talking balloon. If you push on that, a chat uh, bar will come up on the side and you can write in that a question or a comment during the presentation. If you would like to say something next to the chat balloon, there's a little hand. And if you press on that, we know that you've got something that you'd like to say. Um, so we can um, we can do that at the end or when there's a gap in the conversations. If you can't see any of those things, and some people can't, I will have my email open. So please send me an email or press your video button and then we are able to see you and you can ask a question after the presentation. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting in the Golden Broken, the people of the Yorta Yorta and the Tongarong Nation, as well as Indigenous peoples of the land you are joining in from. This project is funded from the Victorian Landcare Program and is hosted by the Golden Broken Catchment Management Authority. The history of this project is that the coordinators and facilitators of the Golden Broken CMA North Central CMA and the Karangamite CMA were originally going to meet collectively um, to share ideas and extend our knowledge through peer support. This was scheduled for early May. We all know what happened and um, so we couldn't meet. Trudy was one of the speakers that we had lined up to host a workshop with the group. And I originally heard Trudy speak at the Beechworth Festival of Change in 2019, I think Trudy and was keen to hear more about the concept of messaging for change. Um, we have had a great response from facilitators across the state. So whilst COVID prevented our facilitators and coordinators from meeting face to face, it has provided us with an opportunity to share this training with you all from around Victoria and some in, even into New South. So a very warm welcome to you all. I'm very excited now to present Trudy, welcome Trudy Ryan to the stage from Words for Change. Now, just for those who have just called in, please turn your microphones on mute and your videos off to save our bandwidth. I'll leave my um, video going. Um, if you need to ask a question, email or chat box or raise your hand or switch on your um, face, your video. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, a very warm welcome from a very chilly Beechworth in northeast Victoria, where I'm coming to you today from our shed. Um, thank you, Kirsty, for the introduction. And thanks, everyone, for your interest in values based messaging and this webinar series. Um, as Kirsty said, my name is Trudy Ryan. I run a communications business called Words for Change, and I work with people and organisations on messaging strategies to create positive change across the social and environmental sectors. So it's a pleasure to be working with you over this <laughs> Um, and I have a great respect for the work that you do as Landcare coordinators and facilitators. I'm a huge ad admirer of Landcare's fusion of people and place and wellbeing. So just stop there, Trudy, and I'll just remind people to turn their videos off um, while the webinar is in process and um, then mute off, please. Thank you. 
Over to you, Trudy. Thanks, Kirsty. So, Trudy, yep, yeah, great. We're seeing yeah. the right thing. Yep. All right. Good. Day. Um, so, over to you. I think we've got about 40 um, Landcare facilitators coming online today. If you can just type in your chat box to say good day to each other um, and see I've, I've arrowed it where it is because she's told you where it is. So your name and just where you're from so we can get a sense of, of who's online and where you're all calling in from. You can see that is the chat box working for people? If you can't do the chat box, um, just send me an email and I will put it in for everyone else to see. We've got Kat from Upper Goulburn Landcare Network, all from Beechworth. Okay, my, um, Alicia coming from Karangama down Geelong, um, West Gippsland, East Gippsland, Bendigo, Great to see, great to see the geographic spread of where you're coming from. Um, okay, so welcome everybody. Um, we'll, we'll get into it. Um, so what is values-based messaging? So values-based messaging um, <clears throat> is a new approach to communication that can really help you as land care facilitators and coordinators when you're communicating with people and trying to activate positive behavioural change. So values-based messaging is messaging that changes hearts, minds and behaviours. So it's an evidence-based approach that draws on evidence from a whole range of fields, cognition, linguistic, psychology, sociology, evolutionary psychology, and it, and it matches our understand, deep understanding of human values, motivation and, and framing and brings, and we're going to go into this in quite some depth over the next few weeks. So we engage people on shared values. We, we sort of create the type of message that you want to tell and that your audiences want to spread. So we stick to the truth with values-based messaging. This is not the Donald Trump approach to messaging and spin. This is about presenting evidence, data, information within a values-based frame that means something to our audiences. So how will we go about this? We've got four weeks to unpack this approach. Um, and learn how you can apply this work, this, this approach in your work as land care coordinators and facilitators. So today we're looking at facts and frames. So think of today as setting up the foundation for the next few sessions. It's really important that we develop a shared base of understanding on how frames work and why facts alone are not enough to drive behaviour change. Next week we're going to have a deep look at human values motivation and how to prime greater good values in your messaging. And in week three, we're going to run through some tips and techniques for strengthening your messages. And we're going to really look in detail at metaphors. Um, in week four, we're going to bring all, all this learning together and go through the process of how you can develop your own values best messages for your work. Okay, so let's make a start with the, the cold hard facts about facts. So I hate to break it to you, but facts are not at all persuasive. If facts were persuasive, the, the graph on the right, um, the percentage of American people saying that climate change is happening in human cause would be a lot higher than 41%. So why? Why aren't the cold hard facts enough to move people? Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons why our fact-based messages aren't getting through. Um, we'll just run through some of them. So if like if you're like me and you have a science background, then you might have been taught that reason is rational, that people when presented with evidence will, will come to factual, unemotional and universally consistent judgments. And this is the foundation for something called the information deficit model, where we just have this idea that if, if only people knew they'd act, and if we just tell them about the thing, whatever the thing is, is that they'll act. But research in the cognitive sciences over the last few decades has just killed off this information deficit model, thinking that we can change people's minds and urge them to act by confronting them with more and more urgent data is flawed because we just don't work that way. Um, as passionate, passionate environmentalists, we often start our communication with problems to try and get people's attention. 
So a message is um, something like, you know, this species is doomed if we don't act now. Or I saw it on the weekend that um, that really struck me. It was scientists warn collapse of civilization is inevitable. Now enjoy your weekend. The problem with problems is that people already have enough of them and so they switch off, they, they turn away, even if those problems are based in compelling facts. Distractions are another biggie. Um, we're bombarded with thousands of messages every day. So you'll have, your facts have to be pretty special to break through the noise and get people's attention and be memorable. And fundamentally, as communicators, we need to get our heads around this, is that people essentially are seeking affirmation, not information. So we seek information that confirms, not confronts our worldview, our values, our identity. So look at the emotion that this person has invested in this conspiracy theory. It's very hard to displace a feeling with a fact. So to disrupt these biases and barriers, we really need to apply the science of communication to communication. <clears throat> Otherwise, we're wasting our time, our effort, our resources and really precious opportunities to connect and drive change. So in land care and throughout the social and environmental sector, our communication resources are always limited and stretched and we can't afford to do communication for communication's sake. We need to be strategic and that strategy starts with an understanding of how people really reason about information and what will move them and drive change. So we're not robots, at least not yet. Um, more information, more facts won't change hearts, minds and behaviours. We have to understand how reason works and how to apply this in our messaging. So people reason through values, frames, metaphors and imageries and not in data and facts alone. And we'll talk more about these elements over the next weeks, but for today we're going to be focusing on facts and framing. So what are frames? Frames are the, the neural circuits in our head. They're physical, they're hardwired. We build these up over a lifetime of learning and experience and they're tied absolutely to emotion. They're within us, they're embodied, it's visceral. And our frames act as cognitive shortcuts for us when we're, when we're um, approached with information. And we use these frames to filter, reject or, or otherwise process information and so it's mostly happening beneath the level of our conscious awareness. Most of our reactions to incoming information happens within, occurs within a tenth of a second. There's a saying in cognitive science that neurons that fire together wire together. So when frames are activated in your head, they are strengthened and with repetition they become stronger and more automatic over time. So the more Donald Trump tweets law and order, the more this authoritarian militaristic frame is activated in people's head and through repetition it's strengthened. And by spreading fear and the idea of lawlessness, the more likely people may be to vote for a more authoritarian president in November. So frames shape how you think and how you reason. And frames define our, our own sense of common sense, what just seems right to us. And this is why two people can interpret the same information or experience completely differently because they're filtering information through different frames or worldviews. So how are frames evoked? They're, they're evoked by words and especially metaphors, which can be extremely powerful and sometimes used quite downright manipulatively, as we've seen a lot lately in the news. So the words we use fires up that circuitry that you've associated with the the words and that that pulls up your experience, your values, your emotion and it connects that whole set of associations through neural circuitry and that's the frame through which you'll interpret new information. So there's frames, there's the frames that are in our head, the neural circuits and then there's framing and framing is the way that information is presented to us deliberately or otherwise. So framing activates deep frames inside of us. So the whole panic buying of toilet paper activated a fear and scarcity frame in some people. 
Framing can hide or highlight information. So just as in this drawing, the, the, the child is shining a light on the fish. That's where our attention is drawn. That's what's highlighted. But we can see that there's other elements in the background, but they're just not in our conscious attention. So for example, uh, sort of collective passage out of the COVID lockdown has been described by people variously as snapback, which was our Prime Minister was talking about a while ago, a journey, a reimagining, and even a nice one I read the other day as a portal into a different future. And there's, you've probably heard many more. And all these different frames will fire up um, your neural circuitry and offer very different reasoning approaches. Those frames hide or highlight different options. And in this sense, framing can really narrow or widen our options of thought. What are we thinking about? Are we looking at the fish? There's an owl behind the boy in that, in that photo, but we might not see it. And it can also open or constrain our creativity. So framing ultimately shapes how we think about something. And this mostly occurs beneath the level of your conscious thoughts. So framing is everywhere. You can't escape it. All words evoke frames, whether you intend them to or not. The, the question is for us to contemplate is whose frames are in our head, in our heads and in the heads of others, and how did they get there? I wanted to run you through an example of, of framing. So you can, in, using an example close to our hearts in NRM and conservation, to see how it's done. This man is Frank Lance. He was the communications consultant to President George W. Bush. And this man's a master framer and he's twisted social reasoning on all sorts of things. So he framed, for example, undocumented immigrants as illegal aliens and drilling for oil as exploring for energy. And he also turned global warming into climate change in the early 2000s. So, I'm going to read you some text that comes from his, you know, now infamous climate change memo, which you can Google and read online, where he, he advises the administration, it's time to, it's time for us to start talking about climate change instead of global warming. Climate change is less frightening than global warming. While global warming has catastrophic connotations attached to it, climate change suggests a more controllable and less emotional challenge. And of course, that's what they did. This reframe took people and human agency out of climate change, and we've struggled to connect the two since. So the idea behind this framing change was that climate just had a nice connotation and might make you think of holidays in faraway places. And change in and of itself leaves out human agency or causation. The climate just changed. And within this frame, no one's to blame. And by, you know, by extension, if no one is to blame, no one has to or even can do anything about it. Change just is. Closer to home, continuing this climate framing theme, is another example of framing in action. So when the Gillard government introduced a carbon pricing scheme, the Abbott opposition went in hard using repetition to reframe the carbon price as a carbon tax. So always think, what's in a frame? What do these words evoke? If you're thinking about a pricing scheme, you might think it might drag up associations of economic instruments like trade-offs, user pays, incentives, disincentives. But what's in a tax frame? Well, tax is a bit of a dirty three-letter word these days. So the, the dominant frame that's been constructed around tax is it's about being gotten at and it's about a burden. It's something you don't want to do. It's very effective. It generates a lot of fear and it's used exhaustively in political campaigning. So knowing this, the opposition reframed the carbon, the carbon pricing scheme, the carbon tax, and they went in hard with repetition, carbon tax, carbon tax, carbon tax, over and over again, activating and strengthening those neural pathways until even the, even the government started using that same language. So it will forevermore be in our minds, the carbon tax, and this repetition and campaigning went on and on and on until eventually the legislation was repealed. So you might have missed this, but as an end note to this framing example, um, a few years ago, Peter Credlin, who was Tony Abbott's chief of staff at the time, uh, admitted on her Sky News program that 
that carbon tax was just a reframe, and this is what she said. Along comes a carbon tax. Oh, it wasn't a carbon tax, as you know, but we made it a carbon tax. We made it a fight about the hip pocket and not about the environment. So this, this reframe that happened those, um, a few years ago on the carbon pricing scheme, it shifted hearts and minds and behaviours and policies and outcomes. And as a nation, we're still messing around trying to wait, find a way forward on this issue. So framing is more than just a matter of words. These, these words can shape worlds. So let's have a go at trying to put some framing into practice. Here's two words that roughly describe the same thing, environmental regulations, environmental protections. You might use them interchangeably within the same paragraph, not meaning to invoke different reasoning outcomes. Um, so we might have a go at um, using chat boxes if you can. If, if you live in the West, um, I'd like you to please consider the term environmental regulations. What comes up for you? So don't ever overthink it. These framing effects operate below conscious thought. So just go with the gut feeling on this. What comes up for you? What associations, emotions, understandings, experiences, connections? So if you could just, just type, for example, in the chat box, West and just a word or two, what comes up for you? And in the East, if you could do the same, but please consider the term environmental protections. So again, don't overthink it. What's your automatic response? And I'm happy to put anybody's email into the chat box so Trudy can relay that. Sure. You might even notice I've done some preemptive framing on you by using different colours just to show you how easy it is to actually influence perceptions. So I'm just checking the, the chat box. Kathleen, protection, protecting what's there. It's positive work. Yep, protections feels like you're doing the right thing. And over in the West, we're talking laws, red tape, East, protected areas, national parks, families, West policy and statutory rules, rules and regs. Restrictions, fines, yeah, getting into penalties, punitive. East, protection certainly feels more positive. So isn't that interesting? We're getting a different vibe of two words that have evoked different frames. The words mean roughly the, the same thing and we could use them interchangeably. But the reasoning outcomes could be quite different. So in what's coming up for people in the West with regulations is that sort of that legal framework, law and order, something you comply with, perhaps something that you're doing in the short term, red tape, restriction, being told what to do. Whereas in the East, we're getting more of a, a positive feel, a family feel even doing the right thing, something about doing the right thing into the future. Um, so yeah, that, isn't that very interesting? So you can see just in practice how these framing effects can work. So it's more than words. Okay, so the thing about framing is we, we are capable of seeing the world through multiple frames or viewpoints but just not exactly at the same time. So if you can take a moment to have a look at, at this picture of this man, then you can see the side profile and you can see a front profile. You can see both, but you can't see them at the same time. So take a while to, to look into that picture and notice that effect. You can't blur the two images. You can see one or the other, but not both at the exact same time. So in the same way, we can never activate alternate frames of reasoning simultaneously because of the process of what's called mutual in inhibition. So one set of frames or neural circuitry is activated in your mind. The activation of alternate frames or neural circuits is momentarily blocked. So this is why myth um, multitasking is a myth. You can't actually do two things at once. So think of our COVID example from a few slides back. We can think about what comes next is through a snapback frame or a reimagining frame with very different reasoning outcomes. We can't imagine it at the same time. We're just thinking one, we're thinking the other. So our challenge as communicators is to toggle people into the desired frame that works best for our messaging 
and that for us, of course, is a reimagining, and hold them there. And then to activate and strengthen that neural pathway through repetition until that frame just becomes common sense. So just as the Abbott opposition did with carbon tax, carbon tax, carbon tax, they toggled and hold people into the frame that worked best for their messaging. So, so keep that in mind. We can view multiple pathways as in own options in different frames, but not at the same time. So facts need frames or facts bounce off frames. If facts aren't framed in a way that will resonate in people, then the facts just bounce off their existing frames. So for example, research showed if, if you don't believe in climate change, you're less likely to attribute an extreme weather event to climate disruption than someone who does. So it's the opposite of that old saying, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. It's actually the other way around. If you don't believe it, you just won't see it because the facts will just bounce off. So this is a hugely reinforcing process to be aware of as well. So if we read information that we agree with, that actually triggers a dopamine reward in our heads, which reinforces the frame and becomes another positive feedback loop, strengthening, activating and strengthening those frames. And this is all really accelerated now through social media. So think about how Facebook works. It taps into our tendency to seek affirmation over information and shows us posts that we've liked, previ liked posts that we've liked, liked previously and that reinforces our worldview. It's a very powerful action. So let's move now into reframing or how you might respond to a frame that you oppose. So say for example, someone, um, even former prime minister, saying something like climate change is crap. So how do you respond to that? You know, really take a moment to think about how do you respond to that? Climate change is crap. And before you start loading up the chat box with swear words, um, really think how do you respond to that? Your automatic response is just to refute that, to refute that very crossly and say something like climate change is not crap. But what do you do when you're doing that is you're actually just reinforcing the frames and the circuitry around that argument. So <laughs> watch what happens when I, when I remove the negation, the not. We're just left with the assertion, climate change is crap. And research shows that we remember the assertion and we forget the negation. This negating a frame activates a frame. So why use this? And it's because you have to think about something in order not to think about it. So if I say for you example, you know, don't think of an elephant. What comes into your mind? What circuitry is activated? Don't think of an elephant. Don't think of an elephant with their big floppy ears and their long trunk and their big tusks. Don't think of an elephant. What are you thinking of? You're thinking of an elephant because you have to think about something in order not to think about it. So reframing requires a rewiring of the brain. A change in understanding can only occur through the activating and strengthening of a different frame. And always remember that mutual inhibition. We can see frames, we can understand different frames, different perspectives, but not at the same time. So we need to toggle and hold people into the frames that best suit our messaging. The best thing to do is simply reframing your messages. And, and I've called this own your own frame. So reframing is about changing how you think. Put your message in a new frame. Don't, don't refute someone else's message. Think literally and metaphorically about putting your frame, your message into a new frame. This means you're telling your story, not theirs. This avoids that tendency to negate, which we do a lot in, in conservation and uh, environmental politics. This avoids negating and activating an opposing view. Tell your story. And we speak the truth and we speak it with moral articulation and, con and conviction as well. So back to that example, climate change is crap. Say your story. A, re a simple reframe might be something like, humans are disrupting the global climate system. So 
Positive persistence beats negative resistance. This is a really good one to keep in mind if you're working in messaging in this social and such an important field, this social and environmental area. So this is a tip from Professor George Lakoff, who's pictured, and he pioneered much of the global work on framing and cognition. And he's a tireless advocate for progressive causes. And you can look up, um, he's just produced a wealth of um, research and guidelines that you can access. If you just Google him on the web, you'll be gone for days. So we have to tell people what you want them to think or do, not what you don't want them to think or do. So for example, if you've got kids running around a pool, yell out, walk. Don't say, don't run. Tell people what you want them to think or do, not what you don't want them to think or do. Tell your story. Okay, I wanted to, to finish off this part of the session today with three broad frames that I find work really well um, across the social and environmental sector, and I think they'll work well for land care as well. Um, so these sorts of frames form the heart of powerful, empowering values-based messages. Hope in this sense, um, fear, fear is attractive because fear garners people's attention um, and it might sort of, you know, inspire some sort of short-term activism or clicktivism these days. But hope is what you want to aim for. And we'll talk more about hope next week when we talk about values. But hope in this sense is not about just hoping for the best. It, it's about a mindset that imagines that there is a possibility to work towards. So it's more endearing and it's more enduring and it's just plain nicer to work in and message in than fear. And you can't sustain a movement based in fear. So we need to provide a vision in our messaging and give people an aspiration. So as many people have, have pointed out recently, Martin Luther King had a dream not a 12 point plan or a policy proposal or a worse, a complaint. So people want an aspiration. They want something to hope for. So don't get caught up on the details in your messaging about, about we're going to do this and we're going to do that. People will stop reading and listening. They just want to know how will their lives be better. So provide that provision, give that aspiration. Say what you're for and not what you're against. So remember that negating a frame actually activates a frame. So if we if we say a lot and we do in sort of, you know, you see it in protest imagery a lot, don't do this, stop that, end that, know this. What you're just doing is reinforcing that frame of what you don't want. So say very clearly and very articulately what you're for. Create some good as well. So people want to be on the right side of history Focus on not just ameliorating or reducing harms, focus on creating good through your messaging. Find solutions, not solve problems. Focus on the benefits of doing something over the risk of not doing something. And that's particularly important in climate change messaging. So of course we need to be real and we need to acknowledge and address the challenges of what we face and that the action is needed quite urgently. Um, one strategy that works really well is, is recalling past challenges and how we overcame previous challenges together. Um, and the, we've now got this common touch point that we share across society and even across the world and how we've all worked together um, during the coronavirus lockdown and made sacrifices and changes for the common good. So we've got that common touch point now of collective action you know, I remember during the 2020, how we all had to work together for the benefit of society. It's a touch point that we can call on. Of course, we also need to avoid bright siding. So this is kind of everything will be fine. And, you know, focusing on there's so many opportunities of climate change. And if you do overdo that and go too much onto the bright side, it will sound inauthentic and ring false. So we need to keep it real but we need to keep it based in hope. Um, as the American writer that some of you may know, Rebecca Solnit says, hope gets you there and work gets you through, but we need to have hope. Another frame I find 
really useful is this idea of here now together is just something that you can remember in your head and just check your messaging back and go, am I activating this idea of here now together? What I mean by this is that we need to sort of reduce the psychological distance of what we're talking of issues when we're messaging. So we need to bring our issues psychologically closer in space and time so they're more real, more familiar and more urgent to people. And that's because we have this very human tendency to avoid things that are kind of unpleasant that we don't want to do, we don't want to address, that are uncertain and that seem far off in the distance it might be happening in the future or somewhere else. And so, for example, and the ground is shifting a bit on this after our last summer, but climate change is often regarded as something that will happen somewhere else, sometime in the future, to someone else. So it's this idea of there, them and there. So we need to think about in our messaging, how can we create stepping stones to, to bring this, these issues closer to here and now together? So in your messaging, have an endpoint in sight, but message people onto a closer stepping stone or lily pad if you prefer that metaphor. So your message is more relevant to them today. So if we don't do this, we risk invoking the, the bystander effect, that idea that, oh, someone else has got it covered, someone else will do it. This doesn't apply to me. I don't really have to worry about this today. Um, you know, not now at least. So think about how can we reduce the psychological distance of our messages and get people focused on the here now together. We also need to foreground people more in our communications. So not just focus on stats and data, you know, you move people with people. Um, we need to keep our stories, our land care stories, familiar, place-based, so that people can see themselves in each other and build empathy for their, each other's situations. And this works especially well if you reinforce it in imagery. So always, always try to have people in your land care imageries to really link and cement that idea of people and place and people and landscapes and how integrated and interconnected they are. Take a clear and really current tone of messaging, of action in your messaging. So this brings action into the present, so here, here and now. Um, speak from inevitability, and we'll go into this more in week three when we're talking about you know, more than words and message strengthening tips. Um, but have a sense of this is what we do, you know, and this affirms social norms. So use words like we are, not we will, or worse, you know, we might or we should. And this idea of like conviction comes through in our messages very clearly and that builds people's confidence and trust as well. The third frame that I find works really well across the social and environmental sector is this idea of connecting and crossing scales. So we need to connect and cross scales in environmental care more generally, but how can we really weave land care into our story of everyday life? This is another way that we can be, bring things psychologically closer. So the only way that we can really achieve meaningful system change or structural change is through collective action. So to keep people motivated, we need to tell story that link people's individual actions. So what they might be undertaking at, on their, at their farm level, say for example, or the local reserve, and link that with actions that other individuals and groups are taking both near and far to build this sense of what's social norm, this is what we do, and build that sense of a positive trajectory or momentum for change. It's also really important that we broaden the scope of what we perceive to be an environmental issue. We don't want people just thinking, oh, land care, that's for, that's for farmers, or that's for people that are interested in the environment. We need to go, make it go broader and beyond that and link out into other sectors and also by talking about co-benefits. So we can link out to other sectors like health, education, recreation, community connection, um, and link from the rural and regional settings into towns and cities as well. So this again builds that notion of collective action, multiple and diverse groups or constituencies working together for positive change, 
people might do things differently, but we're all basically pushing our barrows in the same direction. So we don't necessarily have to have unity, but we do want to go for cooperation towards this vision of a of the future that we want. So in your communications as well, you can link cross-scale co-benefits of land care, um, talk about people's physical, mental health, um, benefits for recreation, landscape aesthetics, as, uh, sorry, aesthetics, biodiversity, as well as production. So this is often implicit. We kind of imply this in our messaging, but to really drive, the, drive that message home, you need to make that message explicit and really draw out those benefits in your messaging, make it really clear. As I said earlier, people want to be on the right side of history. So really link uh, moral obligation in our messaging as well. You don't have to labour this, but um, which can become, we don't want to go be cheesy, but we do want to link that sense of a moral obligation, doing the right thing, what we do now, will impact on future generations and other species as well. So we need to sort of go beyond ourselves and get that message, draw on people's sense of right and wrong. So as we finish this part of today's session, please have a think about how we're framing land care. And try a bit of land care message testing. So or frame testing. So what I mean by this is just actually ask people, ask your friends, your family, your colleagues, your neighbours, have a chat during the week, ask them what does land care mean to you? And it'd be very interesting to hear their responses and to just reflect deeply on is that response what you intended? Is that the frame that you intended? And how you can strengthen your messages using some of the approaches that we've discussed today. Um, so next week we're going to be talking more about values and how that you can prime those greater good values in your messaging and then beyond that we'll be talking about words and then in week four how we bring these messages together. So thank you for attention during that part of the presentation. I'll hand back to you now Kirsty, we've got time for questions. Great, uh, thanks Trudy. That was um it's always really insightful to hear you speak and um, it's always a good reflection on current practice of what we're doing and you know ways forward I suppose particularly in this time and space. So we've got time for questions guys. Um, either send me an email and I will talk it. Turn on your video if you want to and we'd love to see your face and um, ask a question. I have one to start off to start the ball game. So you were talking about um, global warming um, versus climate change. Is is there any value in us reverting to the previous um, words or language, um, or do we change our tact and move forward in a different direction? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting question, and. Um, and the language, as we know, the language has changed and we've mm. talked about climate catastrophe, climate crisis, and now we're into climate emergency. And, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting one. It's one that I ponder a lot about climate emergency. Is it a good idea or not? So in, on one hand, we know that emergency is something, it's a crisis and it is, there is no doubt this is a crisis point. But the emergency frame, what does it trigger in people? So I always ask about the frame, what does this trigger? And perhaps when we're talking about emergencies, think about what comes into mind. So it could be like, um, you know, emergency services have got it covered. I need to get out of the way. I need to slow down to 40 kilometres as I drive past. You know, it's like, how do I, how do I see myself in, in that? Are we being inclusive of people? or does it actually build in a separation of someone else will do it? Um, we also need to match, if it is indeed an emergency, we need to back that up by actually acting as if, you know, as Greta Thunberg says, you know, a house is on fire. You know, we really need to, to match the words with the actions, not just say it's an emergency and then what's happening, you know? So emergency is a tricky one. Um, crisis, catastrophe, global warming, 
greenhouse effect, you know, they're all different words that we use, but they all do conjure up slightly different frames. So we're going to run out of words. <laughs> you know, we keep looking for, we're trying to, it's kind of like that problem slide. We're trying to get people's attention um, by using more and more alarming frames. One frame that there's a, a group in the UK that do a um, climate out, outreach and they do fantastic work. Um, they're a not-for-profit and I really, you know, recommend you have a look at some of their stuff. They talk about we need to actually start really talking about a prepar preparation frame and saying we it's not about, you know, after a bushfire event or, you know, another extreme weather event related to climate disruption. We need to talk about preparing for a different future, not getting back to normal. And within that notion of preparedness, we also, it drags along associations of acceptance. So acceptance that this is our reality and we do need to work towards it with some urgency and together. Mm. So again, we need, to, we need to go more with the hope frame than the fear frame, but be re very realistic about the challenges we face. But we always need to tie human agency into it as well. And we'll talk more about that in different in the coming weeks. But we need to get that notion of, you know, if this is a human caused by extension of logic, humans can also address this problem as well. So bring people into the frame as much as you can. Thanks, Trudy. There's one from Catherine, C Kathleen Brack, um, and she says she's interested in what you were saying about the importance of showing the collective action that is happening for land care. How can we do that without resorting to facts and figures? Um, well, that's a great question, Kathleen. And of course, you want to use, I'm not saying don't use your facts and figures, but don't lead with them. Leave the stories about people doing this and then you can weave that data into your stories. Um, telling stories that that link other groups as well. So you're telling your place based stories. You might tell a story of what's happening over, you know, in East Victoria and similarly in Western Victoria, you know, this land care group did this and that sort of builds this idea that oh, this is happening here and it's also happening elsewhere as well. This is what everyone's doing and it just builds that um, social norm and builds that idea of of what we expect to do what what we just expect is common sense so certainly using your information but telling it in story form you know how people's lives being better telling your story um, offering some people some hope but also really allowing people to see themselves in this bigger story of weaving place and people and landscapes to, together and to do that always using that imagery as I said so I've had a look at a lot of land care stuff and there's a lot of um, fencing of remnants and you know um, soil conservation works I don't see a lot of people photos so really just always just think I must have a person in this photo and preferably people and there's a diverse group as a diverse group of people if you can different generations cultures, you know, just try to to get people into your imagery to really link that in people's minds that this is about people as much as it is about landscapes. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, anybody else? She's just said thanks as well. Thank you. For those who can't see the chat box. Remember to use the email as well. I know I've been doing a couple of these webinars, Trudy, and the one thing that um, is is difficult sometimes is people sitting in silence and um, going, oh, shit, shit, where's that question? What, it, what, 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 I need to come up with something. But um, just also acknowledge that if you do have something that you think of after, um, that is super fine and maybe we could address it at the start of next week's presentation. Yeah, sure. And ha very happy for anyone to email me with questions as well. Yeah, or email me and I can forward them on to Trudy, whatever um, you want to do. That would be great. So we've got a comment here in the box from um, Kat, and I know it's Kat because it's UG Landcare, so we won't call you UG Landcare. Um, 
she says, my head is whirling. You have presented so many fascinating ideas. And I think you've probably hit it on the head, so to speak there, um, Kat, because that's sometimes the most difficult thing when you hear some new information is actually processing enough to have a question um, or, you know, then go, how, how do I make this work in my in my life? Yeah, Wendy. Sure. Uh, student climate strikes for climate action. Great initiative, but copped a lot of flack from community. Good or bad idea? Oh, a good idea. It's always good for people to protest for their rights and, and what they, you know, the type of world that they want to have. So good on the kids for doing that. Um, one thing about protest imagery, it's not a good, it's not a good idea to use it in your um communications if you're trying to bridge polarisation. So if you look around any local council that has declared a climate emergency, invariably the photo that they use for their article is protest imagery. Might not be the kids climate strike, but it might be protest imagery. And all that does is, <clears throat> is sort of amplify that polarisation because if you're not the kind of person that agrees with it or necessarily agrees with protest, it just immediately puts you on the back foot so the, the imagery that we use, it's really important that it is about adaptation. It's important that it's about people working together to make positive change. So to sort of take in people's imaginations from where we are to where we want to go, if we keep using protest imagery, you know, it just sort of keeps things in a bit of a state of flux. Um, so that's important. So no, I really support the, the kids doing their climate strike. I think it's great and it keeps it, it keeps it also it links and it, the frame, those neural circuits that it kicks off for us is that we have a moral obligation to do the right thing by these future generations. So it keeps that very much top of mind. And I know Trudy, um, for us around our dinner table, it provokes a lot of conversation as well. Um, so that's a valuable thing. Yes, it's always a valuable thing to, dis to discuss these current issues. Yeah. So Alicia has got a comment. Um, she said, so interesting, really looking forward to more in the coming weeks. Thank you for your insights, Trudy. Great. Thanks, Alicia. And, and I appreciate um, going back to Kathleen's comment as well. It is your head does whirl around this stuff and, it, and it's endlessly fascinating because it just gets to the heart of how people think and what makes them tick. And um, I've been working in environmental communication for about three decades now. And I must admit, I, I was, you know, probably one of the worst of the fact-based communicators thinking that if we, you know, if we just get across to people how dire this situation is and, you know, how rates of species decline and all these things, that that would work. And so I would try and jam pack as many facts as I could into any communication that I did. And then, you know, it's, I've, I've stumbled across this approach that really we need to broaden our horizons and we need to not just make, think of communication as being a one-way thing where we just put the facts out there and, and hope that people get our message. We really need to understand where people are coming from and how people actually do reason about facts. Mm. And so much of our reasoning is set in values, frames, metaphors and imagery. So I'm looking mm. forward to going through this with you all over the next few weeks. Um, just on that, there's a question in the email, uh, Trudy, from Sonia, who's in Southwest Goulburn, and she says, are we able to get this presentation afterwards to go back over the points? Yes. I'll just let everybody know that it's, it is recorded and I will send the recording out to everybody who has registered. Yes. Um, and it will be on the Golden Broken Catchment Management Authority. But I think Sonia's probably asking more specifically about the slides. That's fine. And I'll email that to you, Kirsty. Sure. Should I finish? Yeah, great. Thanks, Sonia. No worries. <laughs> yeah, it is something that you need to go over and over. Um, as I mentioned earlier, George Lakoff is a great place to start. Um, he's got a website, georgelakoff.com. He's got a podcast called Frame Lab, which I highly recommend. Um, and he's, he's a really gifted communicator and he really clearly expresses his ideas. Um, you know, he's a, a teacher at university for 50 years or something. So he's really got that great teaching style to his approach. And I really recommend that you look through some of his work to really get a sense around this whole idea of cognition and framing. 
So, um, Trudy, I'll just stay on the line with you afterwards and grab that name and send it out with the email. But we've got a comment from um, Kat again. With all your knowledge and understanding, you must shake your head at some of these tweets and press releases with people spinning ideas to fit their agenda. I've been naively absorbing them. <laughs> Love your honesty, Kat. Yeah, well, yes, it is, as I said earlier, it's just to, to really look at what's happening in the news at the moment and look at it from that framing perspective. Um, you know, we, we say a lot about Donald Trump, but, you know, he's a master framer. Um, and he's activating frames in people that, and it happens beneath the level of our conscious awareness. It puts us into a reasoning mode. Think about that image I showed you of the little child shining a spotlight on one part of the garden. All the other parts of the garden exist, but they're not in our conscious um, view. Think about that with framing as well. What messages are getting out there? What frames are put, people putting in your heads and the heads of others? So just as you go through this week, looking at the news, you know, seeing what's going on in the world, really think about that from a framing perspective. And I've got a message from uh, Rod Eldridge from on my email, and it's I've just posted it in the chat box, but it says how important or relevant is who the message comes from? I've encountered thinking um, where people listen to people like themselves. Yeah, and that's a really good point, Rob. And there's a saying in communications that the messenger is the message. So who the message comes from, it it's actually activates a frame in itself. So, you know, again, to Donald Trump, I wouldn't believe anything he says. <laughs> so I don't trust him as a messenger. So trusted messengers are a really important and really effective part of message framing. So, you know, I think, say, for climate change communications, it's really important that we we have that message coming from multiple, you know, people that are trusted by a whole different range of groups and constituencies, you know, in, in whatever setting that we're in. So it's mm -hmm. a really good point. The, the messenger is the message. Mm -hmm. We can go into more detail later on too. And I've just got a comment from Wendy McKins. Thank you. Makes good sense. Often those we need to help and engage in a problem are the ones that will shy away if protest images are used. Great lot of information. Thanks to Kirsty for bringing it to us and Trudy for your clear information. Looking forward to the next three weeks. And she just has a question here. Can other facilitators get on board and see the recording of this session to catch up? Yes, for sure. I will send a link around um, to everyone and um they will be able to access that it will probably be on youtube i would imagine and i've got one more from i wonder rob fallon from the northern yarra land care group network i wonder who are our best reframers to watch the ones who are doing the ones doing the good work question mark yeah yeah so Another link um, I can share with you is to um, a woman called Anat Shinkar Osario, who's based in the, the US. And, um, you know, she's a, just a fantastic, bold, brave, super intelligent, progressive message framer. Um, and she shares all her work very freely, available on her website. So I'll send that as well. Thanks. Really great clear communication guides on a whole range of topics around that sort of progressive end of politics um, doing really great stuff. Yeah, yeah. and we've got um, a comment from Lisa Wangman, uh, great extension on community-based social marketing info we have been exposed to in the past. Thanks so much for your insight. Right. So Thank it you. sounds like it's touching a nerve with everyone, which is what I was really hoping it would. And it's certainly when I heard it touched a nerve with me. Um, I'm sure if somebody wants to chat with us afterwards um, for the next five minutes, both Trudy and I will stay online. Um, and thank you everyone for participating and coming on board. And we hope that you'll get some valuable information in order to move forward into a more positive and um, I suppose, reflective future of hope. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kirsty. Thanks, everyone.